are back from break. Thank you very much for being here on Bowls.tv Live. I'm David Bowles. It's nice to have you today. Having interesting conversation about student-athletes. And now we're going to take a little bit of a bend and a turn in a different direction. When I was a student at the Columbia University School of the Arts, the Oscar Hammerstein II Center for the Study of Theater Arts, I was introduced to a book called The Empty Space that Howard Stein, my delightful friend and mentor, recommended to me. And this book, The Empty Space, was written in 1968 by a super genius named Peter Brook. And when you're in school, you discover touchstones and cornices that stay with you for what you hope is the remainder of your life. And The Empty Space is one such book that I'm going to share with you right now. Why I found it important and how it influences my life beyond just the theater. This is Peter Brook. Still alive! At the age of 96. He's English. He's been based in France since the 1970s. He has won multiple Tony and Emmy Awards, an Olivier Award, and has been called our greatest living theater director. And when he was with the Royal Shakespeare Company, he directed the first English language production of Murat Saad in 1964. That show transferred to Broadway in 1965 and won all sorts of awards. So, Peter Brook is a genius. And when he wrote this book, The Empty Space, a lot of his peers ostracized him and criticized the book. They hated the book, and I'll show you why. Peter Brook divides the theater the live stage into three ideas. The deadly theater, the holy theater, the rough theater, and the immediate theater. And that's what he talks about for about 100, 150 pages. He starts with the deadly theater. I can take any empty space and call it a bare stage. A man walks across this empty space while someone else is watching him, and this is all that is needed for an act of theater to be engaged. Yet when we talk about the theater, this is not quite what we mean. Red curtains, spotlights, blank verse, laughter, darkness, these are all confusedly superimposed into a messy image covered by one all-purpose word. We talk of the cinema killing the theater, and in that phrase we refer to the theater as it was when the cinema was born. A theater of box office, foyer, tip-up seats, footlights, scene changes, intervals, music, as though the theater was, by very definition, these and little more. Now continuing on, this is where Peter Brook got into a lot of trouble. The condition of the deadly theater, at least, is fairly obvious. All through the world, theater audiences are dwindling. There are occasional new movements, good new writers, and so on. But as a whole, the theater not only fails to elevate or instruct, it hardly even entertains. And then at the very bottom of this paragraph, which I cannot highlight because my 
would not let me I'll highlight two things on one page. Of course, nowhere does the deadly theater install itself so securely, so comfortably, and so slyly as in the works of William Shakespeare. What? William Shakespeare? He's, he's the main theater guy. We put on a show with William Shakespeare, a Shakespeare play. We're doing the best theater ever. Not according to Peter Brook, who used to be the head of all Shakespeare in England. And he's saying this. The deadly theater takes easily to Shakespeare. We see his plays are done by good actors in what seems like the proper way. They look lively and colorful. There is music and everyone is all dressed up just as they're supposed to be. But the idea is that that theater, the deadly theater, is dead. A not a living theater where people can associate with each other and bring new meaning to old works. They just take the play. They put up the play as it's always been done. They're done with the play, curtain down, everyone goes up, oh, we saw, we, saw, we saw Shakespeare this evening. Aren't we wonderful? We contribute music to the Shakespeare Festival. We've done it all. Thank you so much. So he takes a whole chapter, knocking down the deadly theater. Then he goes into the holy theater. Now that's interesting. You start dead and you, the next idea you have is holy, okay? I am calling it the holy theater for short, but it could be called the theater of the invisible made visible. The notion that the stage is a place where the invisible can appear has a deep hold on our thoughts. We are all aware that most of life escapes our senses and see this is why this book stays with you forever you read it as a student and you talk about it in class and you talk about it privately with Howard Stein and then you go back later when you're older and wiser and smarter and you read that line we are all aware that most of life escapes our senses and it sort of rocks how you think it affects how you deal with life a most powerful explanation of the various arts is that they talk of patterns which we can only begin to recognize when they manifest themselves as rhythms or shapes. Now, you could read that sentence and think about that sentence for 50 years and never really quite understand how deep that meaning goes. We observe that behavior of people, of crowds, of history, obeys such recurrent patterns. We hear that trumpets destroyed the walls of Jericho. We recognize that a magical thing called music can come from men in white ties and tails, blowing, waving, thumping, and scraping. And of course, for 50 pages, Peter Brook talks about the Holy Theater and what it means and how you get there and what it should mean to people who create theater. And there are too many of us who say, well, let's forget about what we're doing. Let's just put on a show and have some fun. And that's why a lot of theater has lost its immediacy. You used to go to the theater to get inspired, to go into the streets, to protest to bring down a government. And now you go to the theater often to just forget about your life and have no relationship to what you're seeing on the stage and have it tremble within the life you live at home. Chapter three is the rough theater. It is always the popular theater that saves the day. Through the ages, it has taken many forms, and there is only one factor that they all have in common, a roughness. Salt, sweat, noise, smell. The theater that's not in a theater. The theater on carts, on wagons, on trestles. 
Audiences standing, drinking, sitting round tables, audiences joining in, answering back. Theater in back rooms, upstairs rooms, barns. The one night stands, the torn sheet pinned up across the hall. The battered screen to conceal the quick changes. That one generic term, theater, covers all this. And the sparkling chandeliers, too. So, he's not necessarily a fan of the holy theater. He's not necessarily a fan of this rough theater. But he understands what it is and what it means. And this idea of let's put on a show or let's do stand-up comedy in the back room or let's do dinner theater. Well, those are all kind of manifestations of what Peter Brook calls the rough theater. And we should be careful. If you're into trying to foment change in your life. And then after making those arguments of what the theater is but should not be, Peter Brook brings us to this final thought. The final chapter, chapter four. The immediate theater. Again, you read this chapter and it affects your stasis in life and your status as a human being. There is no doubt that a theater can be a very special place. It is like a magnifying glass and also like a reducing lens. Two things, same time, opposite ideas in the same moment. It is a small world, so it can easily be a petty one. It is different from everyday life, so it can be easily be divorced from life. On the other hand, while we live less and less in villages or neighborhoods and more and more in open-ended global communities, the theater community stays the same. The cast of a play is still the size that it has always been. The theater narrows life down. It narrows it down in many ways. It is always hard for anyone to have one single aim in life. In the theater, however, the goal is clear. From the first rehearsal, the aim is always visible, not too far away, and it involves everyone. We can see many model social patterns at work. The pressure of a first night with its unmistakable demands produce that working together, that dedication, that energy, and that consideration of each other's needs, that government despair of ever invoking outside wars. So the immediate theater is a theater that surrounds you, that has meaning and purpose beyond just make-believe and putting on a show. The immediate theater is the theater of the mind, of the life, that we all try to live sanctimoniously together while pretending that we're not sanctimonious. That is the point and the issue of Peter Brook's The Immediate Theater. And the last little bit. Oh, we lost our music. Let me see what's going on. Okay, music is back. So this is how Peter Brook ends his tremendous book, The Empty Space. In the theater, the slate is wiped clean all the time. In everyday life, if is a fiction. In the theater, if is an experiment. In everyday life, if is an evasion. 
in the theater if is the truth. When we are persuaded to believe in this truth, then the theater and life are one. This is a high aim. It sounds like hard work. To play needs much work. But when we experience the work as play, then it is not work anymore. A play is play. And that is the lovely drama and the lovely lesson of Peter Brook in The Empty Space. Now, when you read something like that, you try to, if you're being a thoughtful person, apply the ideas to other parts of your life and the world around you. So this isn't just a book about the empty space that is the theater. It's about life, it's about art, it's about education, it's about the human soul, it's about the human condition. And there are four parts of all of these things, deadly, holy, rough, and immediate. And only one of them is beneficial, the rest are very deep, threatening dangers. And how you spend your time, life itself, is deadly, holy, rough, and immediate. And Peter Brook is trying to say the space, the empty space, the space in front of you, the space that surrounds your life can be immediate and of the moment and special and affecting other people around you. Or you can choose to be haphazard and rough and cruel. You can pretend to be above you other people, pretend, uh, pretend to be holy. Allow the deadliness of the dead spirit of what's come before you define you and surround you now. Even more simplistically, just think of building or buying and moving into a new space where you live. More dramatically, a house, a home. That is the ultimate empty space that you choose to decorate and create and improve and surround. And do you want that space to be a safe space, a predictable space, a dangerous space, a space that provides you warmth and love of friends and family and pets and other inspirations? like artwork or exercise or woodworking. These are all choices that you can make. And unfortunately, as Peter Brook warns us, too many people make the wrong decisions. They think they're going one way and they, they're actually going in just the opposite. But the ultimate lesson of the empty space is this. Peter Brook is talking about the theater but what he's really talking about is the mind, your mind, the reader's mind. And that encompasses your joyful soul and your human condition. And then he asks you without asking you, what kind of life do you want to have? Do you want one that is deadly and boring and predictable and you are where you're from and you are born, work and live in the exact same neighborhood, in the exact same town, your entire life? Or do you chase fame and profits and proclaim yourself to be a deity or a follower or of ideas that don't belong to you? A propagator of indoctrination? Or do you choose to go another way with your life? Or you're imprisoned, or drinking too much, or stuck in depressive states from which you cannot escape. Or finally, do you want a life of the mind where you're always in the moment? You are always of the instant, 
You're always searching for new things to learn and new ideas to try and new satisfactions to support while defeating the rough, the holy, and the deadly. So that's how one book, The Empty Space by Peter Brook, has affected my life for the last 30 years, and I've enjoyed every single minute of it. And now, because life is up and down, and life is twisted and corkscrewed around different corners and different angles, you know what time it is.